This story starts 13 years ago. I was a graduate student in the neurobiology department here at UCSD, and I went into student health one day because I hadn't been feeling well. And at the end of that day, I went home with a diagnosis of advanced testicular cancer. Now, normally, this is a terrible thing. But in this case, it set me on a path that has brought me here today. So during the course of my treatment at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I realized something pretty profound. Most of the medications that I was taking were derived from nature. Now, I'm a scientist and have been a biologist my whole life. And I didn't know this, so I was blown away. And I decided that when I got back to San Diego, I would change the course of my studies and learn how to do this. So when I got back, the administration was very generous and let me change the focus of my dissertation. So I embarked on this journey and found an incredible community here at UCSD that was doing this work uh, in a very cutting edge fashion. One of the first things I learned is that over 65% of all our drugs are actually derived from nature. From morphine, which is derived from the poppy plant, and changed the course of surgery and the way that we treat pain, to aspirin, which was the modified component of the white willow bark and treats fever and inflammation. This was known since 400 BC, but it wasn't until the scientists from Bayer actually turned it into a drug. To penicillin, Alexander Fleming's discovery in 1935, when he, when he saw a mold preventing the growth of a bacteria. This changed the course of humanity and is probably a large part of why we're all here today. And we have lovastatin, which reduces human cholesterol. Fascinating a microbe, a fungus, that produces something that reduces human cholesterol. And finally, to Taxol, the drug that would eventually save my life is actually produced by a symbiont of the Pacific yew tree. Now, why would compounds produced in these organisms actually treat human disease? I was fascinated by this. And as my graduate studies continued, some remarkable studies began to emerge regarding the human microbiome. All of these drugs are produced by microbes. So these studies, powered by the advances in genetic sequencing and in computational power, actually began to show something amazing. The human microbiome is much bigger than we ever expected. It's actually outnumbers in cells, the human cells, by 10 to 1. Genetic composition is actually 100 to 1 versus human. So we are not necessarily humans. It's changing the way that we think about health, the way that we think about medicine. These microbial populations have been shown to impact heart disease, obesity, immunity, cancer, and even neural development. This is an outstanding discovery. But it doesn't just hold true in humans. It's actually something that our planet is covered with. In 2009, there were 20 million estimated species on our planet. That number has changed to approximately 1 trillion. That means that less than 10 years ago, we had underestimated the vast, vast majority of life, less than 1 1,000th of 1%. This is less than 10 years ago. The majority of this diversity of life is actually microbial. So this is a new tree of life that captures that diversity. Over here in the corner are humans. Right next to humans are amoeba. Everything else is microbial. This is amazing. This means that everything that we normally associate with life and with evolution sort of lies between two points. No wings no scales, no venom. The rest of this diversity just relies on chemistry. This is the language of life and the source of these medicines. As you can imagine, these medicines are actually much more complex than anything we make synthetically. Take Gleevec. This is something 
produced by humans and is kind of a pinnacle of human uh, synthetic chemistry. It was designed by scientists to fit a specific receptor in cancer and by all measures is a very successful drug. Take rapamycin. This is something discovered on Easter Island in 1975 as an antifungal agent. This antifungal was soon discovered to be an incredible immunosuppressive as well as an anti-cancer agent. What's remarkable is that this is actually the first molecule ever to have statistically shown to extend mammalian life. This molecule extends life and is currently in clinical trials for dogs for just that. This chemical diversity is fascinating. This language of life that we don't understand yet is the source of many new therapeutics. One of those places that is just tremendously understudied is the ocean. This is halochondrin B, a molecule produced by a sponge. The right half of it is actually a successful cancer therapeutic. It prevents cell division in a novel way, but we don't know what the rest of this molecule is actually doing. Another way to think about synthetic versus natural, naturally occurring chemistry is to plot it in space. This is what synthetic chemistry looks like with the distribution of these compounds representing chemical diversity. The more tightly clustered they are, the more similar. So this is synthetic chemistry, naturally occurring chemistry, much more broadly. So I left graduate school with these ideas, and I was hoping that I would be able to somehow harness this chemical language, this chemical diversity, to more efficiently yield new breakthrough therapeutics. And with the hypothesis that if we started with a tremendous chemical library, this chemical diversity, this language, and we tested it repeatedly across different diseases over and over again, it would yield a tremendous data set. And if you use this data set and combine it with the modern computational power, AI, machine learning, deep data mining, we would be able to yield better new therapeutics like ever before. So over the last five years with an incredible team of young scientists and entrepreneurs, we've launched this effort and actually validated this approach. Starting with the ocean, We've been all over the world collecting amazing samples. This is us in Curacao with Fabian Cousteau. We talked our way onto this sub, and we brought up these sponges, which are now part of a medicinal chemistry collection. If we go back to our sample of chemical space, what we're doing is actually expanding it, right? We're making it bigger. We're expanding the possibilities for drugs. And so one of the approaches that we use to start mining it is something developed here at UCSD called molecular networking. So molecular networking allows you to see the similarities between all of these dots. Each of these dots represents a molecule. And instead of finding a needle in a haystack, it's really treating each dot as a needle or perhaps a key that has a lock. And so this approach actually allows us to see the similarities between these keys and the possibility that they'll work on several locks or on which locks they might work. And then as we overlay disease results, as we test in parasitic, cancer, uh, immun immunity, we can begin to ask which of these dots is actually useful for, let's say, rapidly dividing cancer cells. And this was the first place that we pointed this approach. And the first molecule that came out is actually currently part of a targeted cancer therapeutic that's about to enter clinical trials, hopefully. The most recent area that we've been pointing this is uh, immune modulation. Can we find something that actually modulates the human immune system to treat cancer better or to treat infection or to prevent autoimmune disease? But really, my favorite story is about malaria. This is work that we've done with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, over the last two years. Now, malaria is something we don't think about a lot here, but it affects over 200 million people each year, with the majority of them in sub-Saharan Africa, and it kills 1,000 children a day. So we started digging into our big nest of opportunity 
and quickly found something in less than four months that actually treats malaria, perhaps in a totally new way, incredibly potent, and is currently being evaluated further here at UCSD. So the reason that this is my favorite story is that if you think about where we collected this organism, it was the Atacama Desert. We found this algae growing in the Atacama Desert, brought it back, processed it, tested it, and found this thing that was present in less, uh, less concentration than uranium is found in salt water. So it was tiny abundance. This was remarkable. But when we looked in our data, we found it in 25 different hosts from across the planet. Just this tiny, tiny presence of this incredibly potent anti-parasitic agent from all over the world. So as we think about our planet, and we think about diversity, I urge you to think about the potential that lays out there and how little we understand about life and about this language that is all around us. Our microbiome ties us to our communities, to ourselves, to our neighbors. Those communities are tied to our ecosystems, and those ecosystems are tied to our planet. Thread lightly. Thank you. <laughs>